Good evening and welcome to the second in our series of Autumn Science Lectures at Oxford Botanic Garden and Arboretum. My name is Chris Thurigood. This year's theme is plant microbe interactions and tonight Professor Phil Poole will be examining the role of plant microbe interactions in agriculture. Before we hear from Phil some housekeeping, this lecture is being recorded but your camera and microphone are both turned off. If you wish to ask the speaker a question, please use the Q&A function at any time during the talk. We'll then have a short Q&A session at the end of Phil's lecture. If you have any technical difficulties, please use the chat function and a member of our team will get back to you as soon as possible. The recording will be shared after the event via email. Phil is Professor of Plant Microbiology in the Department of Biology here at the University of Oxford, where he leads the Rhizosphere Group. Phil did his PhD in Australia before coming to the UK in 1986. He was Professor of Microbial Physiology at the University of Reading before moving to the John Innes Centre in Norwich. And in 2013, he took up a personal chair as a Professor of Plant Microbiology at the University of Oxford, where he's now the Head of Molecular Plant Sciences in the new Department of Biology. He studies the physiology of bacterial growth and survival in the rhizosphere, colonisation of roots and how bacteria establish symbiotic interactions with plants. A particular focus of his research is the physiology and biochemistry of nitrogen fixation in legume nodules and how this underpins global nitrogen cyc cycling. His agronomy research is truly multidisciplinary, incorporating perspectives from agriculture and soil microbiology. Now I'll hand over to Phil, who will take us on a spin around the hidden world of roots under the soil and divulge some, some of the dark and dirty secrets of plants. Phil, over to you. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I wish I was here in, uh, in person seeing the audience, but uh, we haven't quite reached that stage yet. So I'm just going to share my screen um, and we'll get on with the uh, lecture itself. So hopefully you can now see the uh, the, the, the full screen of the, the lecture. And so I'm going to talk tonight about climate breakdown and agriculture, and I'm going to ask this question about can we square the circle? And hopefully I'll, I'll give you an overview of how important nutrient cycling is. I'm going to concentrate on nitrogen, but it's so tightly integrated with carbon cycling as well that I will digress every now and again to talk about the implications of nitrogen cycling the need to grow crops and also the effect on the, the carbon balance and uh, the problems we obviously have with carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases. So um, what I'm going to do um, to start with is to look, first of all, at nitrogen uh, and the biosphere. So this is a, a, a general sort of look at what happens um, in terms of how nitrogen is, is uh, important in the rhizosphere. Uh, and, and what that is going to do. Um, um, so the first thing to note, and many of you will probably know this, is that nitrogen makes up most of the air we breathe. In fact, it's about 78%. Actually, it turns out, fortunately, that's a very inert gas, because if it wasn't, uh, there would be a great deal of uh, problem, because actually it, it would cause an enormous explosion if that uh, gas was actually uh, easily uh, modifiable. But actually, it's also completely unavailable to almost all biological organisms. We need nitrogen because we need ammonia in amino acids and then in proteins. So it's a fundamental building block in life. But biologically, it has to be reduced to ammonia before it can be usable. Turns out that actually it's only bacteria that can actually reduce N2 gas to ammonia. And that means that most of the biosphere, most of life, has always been dependent on the so-called nitrogen fixing bacteria. They're the bacteria that fix N2 into ammonia. It also turns out that nitrogen is the main limiter of biological production. So the main nutrient cycle, which is limiting the entire biosphere is the availability of ammonia. And about up, up to 50 to 60% of that nitrogen actually comes from a very special type of bacterial association with plants. It comes from so-called rhizobia, which exists 
inside the nodules, inside little growths on the roots of legumes, and that's where they'll fix nitrogen. And I have a few um, pictures to demonstrate that. Um, here we can see uh, some pea plants. These pea plants here are plants which actually cannot, um, uh, are, can, uh, are not given any nitrogen in the growth medium. And these are not inoculated with bacteria, which are able to elicit the formation of these nodules on roots. This is a wild type plant with rhizobia on it. And you can now see it's green. Um, it's a very happy plant. And if you've ever dug up your beans or peas from your garden, um, you'll actually notice these. These are nodules here. These are about two to three millimeters. You might, you'll notice they're dark red because they produce a pigment, which is almost identical to the hemoglobin in your blood, at least identical in terms of its three-dimensional shape. And it binds oxygen and delivers oxygen to the bacteria inside these nodules. Uh, this is actually a, 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 a close-up of a section of a nodule. This is a light micrograph section. So from the tip to the base, again, is about three millimetres. And each of these dark blue uh, um, sort of oblongs you can see with a little white hole in the middle, uh, they're all plant cells. And the staining of the dark blue is full of the so-called bacteria. This next image here is showing an electron micrograph. And now from the tip, to the tail, if you like, of this bacteroid is a this bacterium is about five microns, so five millionths of a meter now. And each of these plant cells are going to be filled with thousands of these uh, differentiated uh, bacteria, so-called bacteroids, which are fixing nitrogen in tight association with the plant. And it's a true symbiosis. The plant is providing carbon and nutrients to the bacteria. And in return, the bacteria are providing the plant with ammonia. So this is one of the most important symbiotic interactions um, on Earth. And it really is uh, one of the major, uh, um, major ways in which we are able to get nitrogen into the biosphere. Um, so I've given a specific example of the legume here. Uh, and this is the example of soybean. Soybean uh, is actually infected by a particular type of rhizobium that's called Brady rhizobium japonicum. And here again, we can see these nodules. In the case of uh, soybean, the nodules are about the size of uh, a, pea, a pea, as you would have in your frozen peas. It's about that size. It's about five millimeters across. But actually, there's a huge range of legumes. Legumes are actually the third largest family of flowering plants. And so a lot of things you will already know, peas, beans, lentils, chickpeas, a very broad range of pulses are in fact legumes, all of which will have uh, nitrogen fixing uh, bacteria inside their nodules. What's really interesting though, and is a, a major part in terms of their agricultural use is that soybeans, for example, are able to produce twice the protein per acre of any other major vegetable or grain crop five to 10 times more than the land that could be used for dairy and 15 times more than land used for meat production. They are the super producers in terms of a, a, the ability to produce high protein grain. And of course, this comes from the fact they're able to fix their own nitrogen into ammonia or the bacteria are on their roots and the plants are able to incorporate that into protein. Uh, so, so we end up with, with this almost miraculous uh, productivity that we can see in, in these legumes. Now, I just thought very briefly, I'd just show you an overview diagram of how this whole legume establishes itself. It turns out that if we take the roots of a legume, initially the plants are not necessarily infected, but the bacteria shown here in red actually stick onto root hairs, these very fine invaginations of the, of the epidermis of plants. They stick onto the plant roots and there's a signal exchange between the bacteria and the plants. The plants make a signal, a thing called a flavonoid, and the bacteria respond by producing another signal called a lipokytoligosaccharide. But essentially, it's just a form of molecular communication. What then happens is the bacteria uh, are tracked by a curling root hair the plant forms an infection tube called an infection thread and the bacteria grow down that 
the infection threads ramify to form a network. And as this is happening, the plant is actually forming a nodule. It's the cortical cells begin to differentiate. They come up to meet these infection threads. And we end up with that nodule structure that you saw before, whereas where now the individual plant cells in the mature nodule are filled with the bacteria which are fixing nitrogen. And this is the process by which uh, a nodule is, is formed. Now, what's um, a very um, important thing to note is that I want you to actually think about what I would consider to be one of the greatest scientific developments in the last 200 years, and it relates to nitrogen. And the point about this is that, um, that um, so in 1898, the Sir William Crookes made a speech to the British uh, Association for the Advancement of Science and he said, it is the chemist who must come to the rescue of the threatened communities. This was a talk given in Bristol upon his inauguration as the president. And what he was talking about was that by 1898, agriculture had run into a major problem. And that's that the use of legumes had been supplemented by adding fertilizer but it was mined nitrate. It was coming from Chile, in fact. It was Chilean nitrate. And the supplies of Chilean nitrate were beginning to run out. And that boosted the productivity that we could get from the use of legumes uh, around the turn of the, the end of the 19th century. What's interesting, though, and I'll show you a picture here, almost everyone will recognize um, Albert Einstein on the right here. But in fact, one of the greatest scientific achievements in the last 200 years was actually the development by um, this man here, who's Fritz Haber and, and was a friend of Einstein's. And what he did was he actually developed the chemistry of nitrogen fixation as an industrial process. This is actually the equation um, for the fixation of nitrogen. This is essentially what happens inside a legume nodule by the rhizobia. They take N2 gas, they combine it with a form of hydrogen um, to form ammonia. So the chemists amongst you realize this is a, actually, it's a, it's a process which releases a lot of energy, but strangely enough, you have to put an awful lot of energy into the process to break the very strong bond between the two nitrogen atoms. So to overcome the activation energy for this reaction actually requires you to put a lot of energy in, even though ultimately the overall process would release energy. In a, what was important was Harbour discovered a way of doing this in the laboratory, in a, in a, in a chemical um, synthesis reaction. And of course it required enormous pressure and temperature. He had to develop completely new forms of chemistry to do this. And in fact, in 1918, he won the Nobel prize in chemistry um, for developing this process. So in fact, he came to the rescue by being able to provide industrially produced ammonia rather than just relying on legumes. And it was Bosch who particularly scaled up this process. It became known as the Harbour Bosch process. And in fact, Bosch won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1931 for scaling up the process itself. So the point about this is this now shows a, 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 the from 1900 to basically to now, what's happened in these industrial processing plants to produce ammonia. Uh, this is actually just showing you in terms of the population that's fed now by nitrogen. And I've always liked to say to people that basically almost 50% of the nitrogen atoms in your body now come from a Harbour Bosch process, from a Harbour Bosch factory. But you can see this is uh, here in 1900 before the Harbour Bosch process. Population of the world was around just below 2 billion. Um, and all this growth here has required the use of synthetic nitrogen fertilizers, which have come from industrial production. Now, there's an allied process, and I've just shown you another Harbour Bosch factory here producing nitrogen. But 
This also in, a, in another um, graph shows you global population. This is the sort of uh, just below 2 billion population in 1927. And now you can see the population rising very dramatically to around 7 billion and predicted to reach something like 9 billion by 2040. Now, what most people don't probably uh, appreciate is that the huge growth in population, which has occurred particularly from the 1960s on, is actually due to the Green Revolution. And this man here, Norman Borlaug, actually developed what were called the Green Revolution crops. And what the Green Revolution crops really are, are dwarf varieties of the major cereals. So if you've ever seen um, old um, lines of wheat, for example, they're very tall, they have a very thin stem, they tend to fall over as soon as it gets uh, too windy, it's called lodging. Norman Borlaug realized if you could develop very short, stumpy stems, the very thick and very strong, they'd be able to support much larger uh, ear, uh, grain, uh, ears of grain. You can see here a more traditional uh, grain of uh, ear of grain, and here a, a, a dwarf variety with dwarf stems and much larger grain. So you could get much higher yields. But the way those yields were, were really achieved meant you had to put a lot more nitrogen and to a certain extent phosphorus onto, onto fields. So with this huge increase in the ability to produce grain, there's also a huge increase in the application of nitrogen fertilizer onto fields. But of course, in the 1960s, it was quite common to have starvation in the world because actually, the world had got to a point where we couldn't feed everyone. And actually today, we may have starvation in some cases, but it's because of a, a failure to distribute food properly, not through an inability to produce sufficient calories uh, to feed the entire population. But there's a consequence of that. On the left-hand side here, I show what's called the nitrogen cycle. And the nitrogen cycle is simply describing how nitrogen is converted from the many different forms that it exists. I told you about nitrogen fixation. That's taking N2 in air and producing ammonia. Naturally, it's done by bacteria. Uh, and today, that's been augmented by industrial production in the Harbour Bosch process. But it naturally cycles back into other forms. It does, obviously, when it gets fixed, uh, naturally, you'd have about a counterbalancing uh, release of it, a so-called um, denitrification, because the ammonia, the nitrogen gets converted to ammonia and gets converted to different forms of nit nitrogen, such as nitrite and nitrate, and eventually gets released back into the air as N2, or primarily as N2, but also as a series of other nitrogen oxides, nitric oxide and, and nitrous oxide. But of course, once we have massive industrial production of nitrogen fertilizer. We now have what's shown in red with all these extra uh, fluxes going into the environment because we're, we're putting so much more reactive nitrogen. And in fact, I'm gonna show you the full um, breakdown of the different uh, balances of nitrogen later on. But in fact, it's, it's useful just to look at the fact that the Harbour Bosch, Bosch process now accounts for something like 150 million tonnes of ammonia goes onto our uh, fields annually in, in a uh, global um, uh, balance. Reactive nitrogen is now twice pre-industrial levels in our uh, atmosphere. One of the problems, of course, when you, you put ammonia or nitrate, because often we actually use nitrate as a fertiliser, that leaches into groundwater, only about 50% of the, the industrial nitrogen we put onto a crop actually gets incorporated into the plant. About the other 50% is almost straight away ends up leaching into the soil and then eventually into groundwater. There's another problem here. I described the denitrification process. So there are bacteria which take the fixed nitrogen if it's available as nitrate in the soil, they will convert it back to N2 in the air. But actually, a lot of it gets converted 
to nitrous oxide. It doesn't go all the way back to N2. Nitrous oxide, I should point out, is 300 times more potent a greenhouse gas than CO2. So this means that there, be, there is large greenhouse gas emissions which effectively come from agriculture. If we look at the global um, food system, this is both agriculture and obviously all the food products as well, there's somewhere between 21 and 37% of annual greenhouse gas emissions come from that process. It's interesting, it's not the same as CO2. It's not, uh, most of this uh, contribution to greenhouse gas emission is as methane and as nitrous oxide. Methane is about 100 times more powerful a greenhouse gas than CO2. They are slightly different, though, in that their resonance time in the atmosphere is not as long as CO2. CO2 is a very stable molecule. If we increase CO2 levels by burning fossil fuels, it'll stay there for hundreds and thousands of years. And it takes a long time to get it out of the atmosphere, whereas the residence time of methane and nitrous oxide are shorter. So as I said, agriculture leads to about 50% of the anthropogenic methane production and about 70% of anthropogenic nitrous oxide production, which is what makes them such serious uh, greenhouse gases. But there is another side where agriculture does lead to very large increases in CO2 production in the atmosphere, and it's land use change causes around about 14% of anthropogenic CO2 release. Uh, and 10% of that is directly due to agriculture. And that's particularly from land clearance, forest clearing, as well as uh, conversion of land uh, to um, the production of crops. So this is what led me to think a little, to talk a little bit about carbon storage and, and where is the carbon in our, in our environment. So this is a little bit of a digression from nitrogen, but we'll come back to nitrogen um, quite quite soon. Just to show in this little diagram here, carbon dioxide itself is cycling because it's being fixed in photosynthesis. Plants are assimilating that CO2 into sugars. They're using light energy to capture the, uh, to use the light energy to then be able to take carbon dioxide and convert it into sugar. Um, but of course, the plants themselves are then respiring some of that sugar back out into the environment as CO2. Uh, and then, but a lot of the, the carbon is then ends up in soil, it ends up in the roots and it goes into the soil microbiome, but the microbial community itself then consumes that sugar and starts releasing it back out to the environment. So it's a very complex cycle, but the numbers sort of explain this um, quite, quite nicely. There's about 120 gigatons of CO2 is fixed annually by plants. Plants respire about 60 of those gigatons and the other 60 is added to the soil. But the soil microbes respire about 60 gigatons a year. So overall, the system would be balanced. We'd have 120 gigatons of carbon dioxide being fixed, but 120 being released. So no net change in the environment. But just to put in perspective, how much carbon is cycling and how, how much is in the environment in the atmosphere is 780 gigatons. That's a lot more than should be there because we're now so much higher than pre-industrial levels because we're releasing it from burning fossil fuels. But note this, in soil, there's 2,700 gigatons of, of carbon. Uh, interestingly, the main um, source of carbon is actually in oceans. It's 38,000 gigatons. Um, interesting though, that carbon in the ocean is largely refractile. It's not cycling. It's a store of carbon, but it's not cycling. Whereas soil is cycling a lot. And that's really important. It's the, the amount of carbon which is coming into soil and back out again is much higher than the contribution of the oceans. And that's really important because whatever we do to our soils, on our planet has a huge impact on how much carbon ends up in the atmosphere. So agricultural practice in itself is a, can be a major contributor to greenhouse gases. And we see that from tropical deforestation, which can contribute all the way up to something like 25% of greenhouse gases. 
because it's 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 removing the ability to keep carbon in the soil. And in fact, I'm often asked, well, why is that? And I've just wanted to show this with two pictures. I've just shown you a picture here of a forest and a picture of a grassland. But these are not to scale, obviously. Uh, the trees are obviously much, much larger than the grasses. But what I just want you to notice here is the enormous network of the root systems. And so the point is when you have a, a forest or a, a mixture of trees and, and uh, mixed planting, you have a huge depth of carbon being deposited from the roots into soil. The same thing if you have a, a mixed grassland or prairie, which will consist of a very wide range of different plants, a lot of grasses, and just notice the different shapes, the different depths uh, of the root systems, which are contributing large amounts of carbon into soil. There are quite large controversial arguments about whether it's better to have forests or reforestation, or whether it's to have mixed grasses and prairie lands as ways of storing carbon. But what we do know, if we clear the forests and we clear these sort of much more complex mixed grass prairie uh, plantings with, for example, agricultural land, and if that's agricultural land just with a crop, or even in some cases, very um, uh, low diversity grazing land, we reduce the amount of carbon stored in soil. So again, we have a huge loss of carbon uh, to the uh, environment. So, okay, that's my little digression into carbon because carbon and nitrogen are so intimately linked. But I thought it would be really valuable. And this is something I, I always uh, in, try to get the message through to students that whatever the arguments are about different uh, processes for climate, uh, mitigating climate change or mitigating the problems of nitrogen in the environment, you have to do the carbon and nitrogen balances. And here's uh, a series of very careful calculations uh, that are done on what are the inputs for, in this case, for nitrogen into, the, into uh, soils and into oceans. Natural biological nitrogen fixation is about 58 teragrams of nitrogen per year. There is also another natural process to fix nitrogen. It's lightning strikes. Lightning will reduce N2 gas to ammonia, and it's about five teragrams of nitrogen a year. Here's a new one. When you drive your car, when you look, talk about an, uh, a, a, a power station, they are generating large amounts of, of reactive nitrogen species, and they're adding about 30 teragrams of nitrogen a year comes from these industrial processes and from transport processes. As I said before, here is the Harbour Bosch process. Fertiliser production is a whopping 120 teragrams of nitrogen a year. We also have to add to that agricultural biological nitrogen fixation. In other words, this is nitrogen fixation where as a crop, we planted soybeans and beans and peas. So we have to consider that is, is also an additional form of nitrogen added into the environment. And it's actually around 60 teragrams. So it's, it's a very large amount as well. So if you add all these things up, um, you, you end up with uh, annual fixation rate. Oh, I did forget to say there, there's biological nitrogen fixation in the oceans, of course. This is particularly from um, algae, single-celled algae, which are fixing nitrogen in particular. And that's a very large 140 teragrams a year. So the annual fixation of nitrogen is around 413, but these, what we would call the anthropogenic sources. So what we have from agricultural uh, biological nitrogen fixation, from Harbour Bosch fixation, and from combustion is 210 teragrams of nitrogen. And I think earlier in this talk, I said, we've doubled the amount of reactive nitrogen in the environment. And that's because we're actually adding 210 teragrams of nitrogen fixation of nitrogen into the environment from these man-made processes. This is just to look not now at nitrogen fixation, but what happens to the reactive nitrogen species? Where do they end up going? We're generating into 
which is going to be reduced to ammonia, but it's going to end up as nitrate, nitrous oxide in the environment. This is the little diagram to show the different sources. And in black is the total, and in red, how much is anthropogenic. So, of course, fossil fuel uh, burning, of course, is 100% of 30 um, teragrams that are being produced. 30, of course, are coming from man made processes. Bio biomass burning is four. Obviously, there's natural fires. Uh, and alarmingly, this value, perhaps the value in black, this is a, a value from 2012. This may be quite a bit higher as we're increasingly seeing massive forest fires, uh, which are, would perhaps increase the black component here. If we look at um, meat ammonia being released directly into the air, around 40 of the 60 is coming from, uh, from agriculture. If we look at NO, about one is coming from agriculture and the other four is natural. If we look at nitrous oxide, of course, we do get this being released naturally uh, from denitrification, um, but around seven of the 13 is now coming from uh, man-made processes. So we can see again, that so much of the contribution of these reactive nitrogen species, which are the ones which are going into the atmosphere to produce greenhouse gases like nitrous oxide, for example, are actually coming from anthropogenic um, uh, uh, production. Now, what are the consequences of all this nitrogen going into our environment? Um, well, this is just a map showing hypoxic areas. You can see the red dots. And hypoxic areas are where oxygen has become limited in the environment. And of course, it actually tends to be clustered around large agricultural areas because this is where the nitrogen, which has been added as nitrate into soil, has been washed into waterways. And if you add a lot of extra nitrogen, and also to a large extent phosphorus, because we mine phosphorus and add it to our fields, our agricultural fields as well. A lot of that is washed into the oceans. And then we get these huge algal blooms, which use up oxygen, and we end up with these dead zones around our coasts. And you'll see they're all clustered around the major agricultural areas of the world, because this is where the nitrogen is being washed into oceans. This is a picture, this is a, an, an American picture, but I'm sure you've all seen these sorts of things. Again, an example where we've got algal blooms. Again, this is in a, 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 in a lake, but we see these, we see these locally, we see these around Oxford even, uh, where there's huge increases in uh, algal blooms. And this, of course, is one of the things which leads to decreased oxygen levels. And then, of course, we have things like fish dying uh, because the oxygen levels for vertebrates in the waterways uh, are now too low. So this is really, in a sense, these are the problems that have been generated through our need to produce large amounts of food to feed the population. In, in a sense, we've come up with ways of managing to do that. The green revolution, dwarf varieties of, of our cereals, producing industrial nitrogen fertilizer, which we can put onto those uh, crops to increase their yields. This is a very important diagram, um, which shows planetary boundaries. And this is estimates. The safe operating zone for the, for, for the Earth is the green bit. And we can look at the, the one that uh, you'd be familiar with already would be climate change. This is shown here in yellow. It's getting very much into the danger zone, but it hasn't quite reached the catastrophic red zone yet. Genetic diversity has reached that already. In other words, the loss of, of biological species, where we know we're now in a mass extinction, a new mass extinction due to loss of genetic diversity. But here, of course, is nitrogen. It's already way into the red. Phosphorus is following it very quickly. And this is being driven by agriculture. So all these problems are tending to compound each other. Um, and, and we can see that um, this, if you like, is, is the laying out the problems on a global scale. I wanted to just take that a little bit further just to look at where we can look at both. This first plot looks at phosphorus. If you like, the red bits are the really danger areas already where we're using far too much phosphorus. You can see it's clustered in the major agricultural areas of the Midwest, obviously in Europe, in China and India, where so much of the world's food is being grown. 
we see the same pattern for nitrogen. Um, uh, we see a rather different pattern if we start to look at um, uh, where we've now got land, change, land system changes, and we can see there are problems in Africa. It's pretty much matched again, though, with freshwater usage, uh, but the concentration of problems, particularly in Asia, where there is now, we're having problems of water shortages again. Uh, and in most cases, it's because this is its use in agriculture. But, and this is an important but, if we actually look at global nitrogen stress levels, of course, North America, South America, Europe, we have huge amounts of nitrogen sufficiency, but we do have, and Africa is a major problem still, where crop yields are actually limited by a lack of nitrogen. So it's not a problem of causing nitrogen pollution here and nitrogen release into the environment. Not enough nitrogen is being used or is available to be able to maximize yields. So we have this double dilemma too much nitrogen is being used in large parts of the world, but not enough in some parts to be able to produce enough food locally. This is just to another way of looking at really the increases in fertilizer usage from 1910 through the present. This is where we've seen this huge increase. We have, as I showed earlier, I believe, in one of the diagrams, of course, nitrogen fixing crops that have been increased as well. So we've got a big increase there. And this just shows that the total anthropogenic use of nitrogen uh, over time has gone up so dramatically in step with population growth. But let's just have a look at some of the different types of legumes that are used. This is obviously uh, close to an interest to me because these are the crops which are associating with uh, different types of rhizobia. They're all infected by different species of rhizobium. We often define the different types of bacteria on the basis of which crops they will infect. So a rhizobium which will infect our um, soybean down here will not, for example, infect the beans or the peas in your garden. But the thing I simply wanted to point out here is that a lot of these legumes are capable of very high rates of fixation. The highest, of course, uh, is soybean. You can get very low rates if they're not grown properly, but they are able to grow. Uh, they're able to actually um, uh, 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 fix somewhere up to 450 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, which is a huge amount of fixation. It's equaled by some of the so-called forage legumes. So these are the legumes that you would grow in pastures, for example, for animals to feed on. We don't, well, I suppose we do eat alfalfa sprouts, but alfalfa we don't actually generally eat as a crop, but we do use a lot of alfalfa in agriculture to increase nitrogen in the soil and to use as a feed for, for, um, for animals. Clovers, of course, are the classic ones used a lot in European agriculture. We know there's mixed clover and uh, grass um, uh, forages, and there are other forages again, um, again, legumes which are producing large amounts of, of nitrogen in, in the environment, or large amounts of nitrogen uh, which, are, which become available for, um, uh, for agriculture, for food, and, and for feeding animals. So, so I hope it's almost obvious now that part of the nitrogen crisis and the carbon crisis does come back down to food. And here's a diagram actually showing us what chance do we have of limiting climate change to either one and a half or two degrees C. And it depends highly on cumulative uh, food system greenhouse gas emissions. So this is Forgetting about how much carbon we might release from, from burning fossil fuels, this is just how much carbon we're going to put into the environment, we're going to put into the air as gigatons of carbon dioxide between 2020 and 2100. So over the next 80 years, if we go ahead with our just our diets as, as normal, we're going to release 1,356 gigatons of carbon. And we only have a 67% chance of limiting 
climate change to two degrees. If we change to plant-rich diets, we can decrease that to 708. If we just simply ate a bit less, in fact, a lot less, to healthy diets, we could reduce it to 946. If we could increase the yield of crops a little bit, we could, we could reduce it to 1,162. If we could halve food waste, it would be 992. If we could just make the whole process of manufacturing distribution more efficient, we could make it 817. If we could do all these things to 50% of their maximum potential, we could reduce it to 506. If we could do 100% of, in other words, switch to plant-rich diets, increase yields, reduce calories, do everything more efficiently and halve waste, we could actually have minus seven. I think that's unlikely, but the point here is to look at what the, uh, the total ability to change uh, the release is depending on what we actually um, do. And what it's telling us, we really have to change the global um, agricultural and distribution system. And it, it's part of that is realizing that something like 75% of agricultural land is actually used directly or indirectly for animal production. So if we take those previous graphs and let's now look at the, what would happen if non-food carbon dioxide emission decreased the zero by 2050. This is all this business of net zero by 2050. Let's, let's actually model what happens if the world's governments actually really did get together and actually did that. Um, I'm not gonna comment on what probability I think of that. Let's just assume it happens. This is what the modelers have done. And they show, well, okay, if we just go on business as usual, fact of the matter is, we're still not gonna stop. We've only got a 67% chance of holding it to a two degree limit just because of the food problem and food agric agricultural CO2 production. Obviously, if we could do everything perfectly, 100%, we went to vegan-like diets or very plant-rich diets and we reduced the waste and so forth, we could get ourselves into a much safer position. But of course, all the other partial solutions up here increase the probability of increasing, um, of both increasing carbon dioxide in the environment and uh, reducing our probability of being able to limit to these sorts of sensible yields, sensible increases in, in um, temperature. If we actually can't reduce our non-CO2 emissions until, to turn them into zero until 2075, you can see the probabilities of everything have shifted to a much worse scenario. Uh, it's almost impossible to limit to a uh, uh, to below a two degree um, C limit. And even if we did 100% of all the, the things we would think are advantageous, we still would only have a 50% chance of keeping climate change to within one and a half degrees. So it is a serious business of considering how we can change um, the global food system and global carbon releases from that. This looks like a complex table. Really, I think the only thing to look at are the, la the last two columns here, and I should have blanked the others out. It's actually looking at actually how much carbon does it take to produce either a kilocalorie of energy in our food or a kilogram of protein. And this is just looking at some common cereals. If we just concentrate on the kilograms of carbon dioxide per kilogram of protein that we get out, so the cereals um, uh, are not particularly spectacular in this regard because they, of course, have high carbohydrate content but low protein. So it takes something like 29 kilograms of carbon dioxide to get a kilogram of protein out of maize. It does a lot better if you look at it per kilogram, per, kil per kilocalorie, because, of course, these are high starch, high energy crops, but they're not so good with protein. If we come down... Um, and we can look at things like potato. Potato is actually pretty good, is pretty good in terms of um, the, the amount of carbon we have to use to produce a kilocalorie of energy. Um, 
modest in terms of per protein, because again, it's a high carbohydrate on crop. If we come to soybean, soybean is the king in this regard. Um, if we look at protein, we need 17 kilograms of carbon dioxide to produce a kilogram of protein in soybean because it's a legume, it's very efficient at producing protein. And so it's able to do that to produce protein with the very with the, the lowest um, carbon yield of, of, or carbon requirement. Let's just come down and let's come and look at some of the animal products though. This, if this doesn't make your eyes water, then you've got a different type of vision from me. For every kilogram of protein in beef, it requires 1,250 kilograms of carbon. Um, that is simply a, a, a staggering um, um, requirement. Cow's milk, of course, is pretty terrible as well because, of course, effectively it's a it's a product of a, of, of the cow, and it requires 260 kilograms um, per kilogram of protein. Compare that to soybean and to many other legumes would be very similar to that. Pork is a bit better, it's 150, and poultry meat is probably the best of the animal meats in terms of the carbon production. It, it only requires 110 kilograms of carbon uh, for a kilogram of protein, but still a much higher, obviously, than we get from legumes. The point is much of modern agriculture unfortunately, is about growing soybeans, but instead of feeding them to humans, we feed them to animals. The majority of legumes are actually grown to feed animals. And we'll often see the argument produced about how terrible soybean is because they're chopping the Brazilian rainforest down to grow soybean. But the only reason they're chopping the Brazilian rainforest down to grow soybean is to feed the soybean to cows to produce hamburgers and beef. So the problem isn't soybean, the problem is using soybean to feed animals to produce hopelessly um, inefficient um, uh, protein instead of using the soybean to eat the soybean. It's a very good um, 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 product directly. Um, and in, in Asia, of course, huge amounts of tofu and soy products are eaten. So what does that mean in terms of what does your lifestyle mean in terms of your per capita carbon production or ca capita? Uh, if the baseline, this is a typical Western diet, would be somewhere around about nine um, tons of CO2 per year in your uh, food uh, consumption. If you simply reduce your meat uh, consumption by 50%, you would reduce it quite considerably to six. If you became vegetarian, interestingly, you would reduce it but actually not nearly as much as a lot of vegetarians think. And the problem you could see from that previous slide I presented is it's milk. Milk is a very high energy product and vegetarians generally tend to drink milk and particularly eat a lot of cheese. Um, if you actually stayed with a, would, would not be a, a vegetarian diet at all, you'd simply say, I'm going to switch away and I'm not going to have beef or dairy and I'm going to switch to pork and poultry. You can actually have a very dramatic effect on your, um, your carbon footprint. You'd be coming down to around two and a half. You can do better if you're going to go vegan, um, if that's what you want to do and you can get it down to around, you know, I guess this is around one and a half. But actually some of the dietary changes are not as radical as you might think it is really moving away from the high um, CO2 um, producing or CO2 requiring things such as beef and dairy. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit in the final few slides about are there some things we can do about this that are apart from changing our diet, which is actually one of the main things we do, changing land practice not chopping down forests, changing the way we do agriculture, no-till agriculture so we can, do not leave soil bare, increasing carbon storage in soils. There are a lot of agricultural practices which can improve that. But there are also some very important developments and some of these are quite staggering. And one of them is to increase photosynthetic efficiency and the 
yields that we can get from photosynthesis. And this might seem science fiction. It turns out it's not. Just to remind people, if you've, uh, many of you will know about photosynthesis, um, actually photosynthesis, uh, of course, is the way in which plants and, and other, and, and bacteria for that matter, in many cases, and algae trap light, what are called the light reactions. They harvest the energy of light and they use it to be able to actually then fix carbon dioxide in, in, a, a, in a cycle, which I won't go into all the details of, but they take that carbon dioxide and produce sugar. And this is called the dark reactions because this, this can occur in the dark. The light reactions produce the energy and they can transfer it to the chemical reactions to fix carbon dioxide into the sugars that we need to eat. But one of the problems of this reaction, the enzyme which does this fixation of carbon dioxide, it's a very ancient enzyme. It's also the most abundant protein on earth. And the reason that the enzyme that does this, it's a thing called ribulose 1,5-biphosphate carboxylase, if you want to know the full name, it's a very inefficient enzyme. It has a very, very low rate at which it fixes uh, CO2, which is why it's the most abundant protein. Leaves and all plants are just stuffed full of this enzyme. One of the other problems, though, is it doesn't just react with CO2. It reacts with oxygen and instead of producing this little nice little cycle to produce sh um, sugars, this is the reaction over here. It actually reacts with oxygen to produce a molecule called 2-phosphoglycolate. I don't want you to worry about all the, the complexity of the biochemistry here, except to see that when you generate this side reaction, which happens naturally in all photosynthesis, the process of this glycolate has to be metabolized and it uses vast amounts of energy to convert the glycolate back into glycerate and put it back into this into normal photosynthesis in other words it's a, a thing called photorespiration which causes a huge loss in efficiency turns out that i'm a i'm a microbiologist there it turns out that bacteria have a completely different way of converting this product glycolate back into glycerate. It requires two enzymes. You can incorporate these enzymes into chloroplasts. And when you do that in crop yields in the field, you increase the grain yields, biomass yields by 19 to 37%. This is not the one or 2% increase in efficiency you can get by long-term breeding. It's staggering increases. There's also a process which I won't go too much into the detail with, but one of the things that happens when plants receive too much light and they receive in a very bright light, they actually decrease the trapping of light. They have to do that, otherwise they get damaged, they get photooxidized. So what they do is they, they have a switch system to turn photosynthesis off. The problem is when they go back into shade, when they should be switching the light reactions back on again, it takes a long time to do it. And there's a paper which came out from, uh, um, um, uh, 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 who was the Abraham's visiting professor at Oxford um, uh, who shared an office and lab with, with me. Um, and this paper came out just a few weeks ago by again, engineering the recovery from this um, uh, shading process they could increase soybean yields in the field by up to 30%. And these are almost certainly stackable um, events which could be introduced into uh, crops in the field. It's not unrealistic to expect it may be possible to get increases in yield of up to 50%. Now, I'm not necessarily arguing for genetic engineering or any of these things, but it's something whether you're for it or against it, you really have to appreciate that it's, it is looking increasingly possible that through these processes, we could increase yields in crops by 50%. And that's 50% without doing anything, without, without using up more land. In fact, we could reduce the amount of land being used um, for agriculture and still meet the demands for feeding a growing population. So there are gonna be some very, very difficult questions for a whole bunch of different um, groups to consider about whether or not um, these processes will actually be used in what would be genetically modified crops. If you're against it, you should know about this because it's important. 
if you're for it, again, you should be aware of, uh, of what these developments are. And finally, in the last two or three slides, I just want to come back to nitrogen. This is actually showing the effect of nitrogen fertilizer in sub-Saharan Africa. And if you remember a few slides back, I showed you many of the parts of the world have too much nitrogen being added, but large parts of Africa had huge nitrogen deficiency. At the moment, this is the amount of nitrogen where the arrow is, where smallholder farmers in Africa would on average add to their crop. And you can see this year, this results in very, very low yields of maize, things around about you know, one and a half tonnes per hectare. If you were to put 25 um, kilograms, and that's not a lot of nitrogen, that's not going to lead to massive nitrogen pollution. The sorts of levels used in Western agriculture and in China are around about 150 um, kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. Then 25 would more than double yields in Africa. And this has led to a large program to see whether or not we could do this by changing the way in which cereals in particular, like maize and wheat and rice, which are not legumes, they cannot fix their own nitrogen. But could we actually introduce nitrogen fixation into these uh, cereal crops? And one of the first ways to try and think about this is actually, this is showing you a maize plant, could we use bacteria which naturally uh, attach themselves to plant roots and which fix nitrogen? Could we get them to do this in an agriculturally important way? This would require us to get good colonization. It would require some form of regulation of nitrogen, and we'd need to get the bacteria to release the nitrogen to the roots. Bacteria normally just like to keep the nitrogen to themselves. What this has led to is a, a program which we've been very much involved in, in getting communication between the microbe and the plant getting the plant to produce a signal which is recognized by the microbe and that signal would control nitrogen fixation to then control the ammonia release from the plant, uh, sorry, from the microbe and also for the microbe to produce reciprocal signals to the plant. So we could control this process. But this is actually the idea of the microbes being just on the surface of the roots. It's not the same as being inside a nodule as we'd have in a legume. So there is one of the important things is the idea, that could we actually introduce nodulation into cereals? And it turns out that there's an, an ancient process where almost all plant roots, cereals, as in fact, 80% of all land plants have a buscular mycorrhizal fungi. And this is showing intracellular infection of a plant root. These are, these are called arbuscules, where they carry out nutrient exchange with the plant. The arbuscule uh, mycorrhizal fungi were the original root systems of the first plants which colonized land. And some of you might recognize here, I put a picture of a liverwort, which is one of the most ancient lineages of plants and a major vehicle for study in Oxford. But what was some very exciting um, data, which has been uh, found over the last few years, if we look at a, this is a tree effectively of, of plants and these are the land plants, the liverworts, the hornworts, the mosses, lycophytes, and angiosperms. There are other land plants, of course, but this is in a study which was looking at this very, very complex series of signaling um, pro, um, genes and proteins. But the point here is not for you to worry about the names of these things or what they're doing, but these are the, these are the genes you need to make arbuscules, to enable the arbuscules of the fungi to infect the roots of plants. And they're present even in the liverworts. So the liverworts here in green, all these genes are present in the liverworts. They're also present in cereals. One of the things which is astounding though, is all these same processes, these same genes and proteins are needed to form legume nodules. Legume nodules actually evolved 100 million years ago. Land plants evolved around 400 million years ago. So legume nodules are much more recent. They simply piggyback onto their signaling system to be able to induce the formation of nodules. And that's very important because this is showing a plant root. 
it forms a nodule using that existing arbuscular mycorrhizal signaling system and then just slightly modifying it to form a nodule structure. So of course, one of the ideas in which it's being funded by a number of funding bodies is to take the sorts of things that we've been doing with bacteria associating with plant roots to fix nitrogen on the surface and to get the bacteria inside engineered nodules on cereals. And that's particularly important, for example, for use in places like sub-Saharan Africa, where even a slightly inefficient nodule, even if it was only producing 25 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, would, en would enable a huge increase in yields in those sorts of countries. So this is the ultimate goal. This is actually me showing a picture of a pea plant that's, I'm holding it here, and you can see the pea plant full of nodules. Uh, this is how legumes achieve such staggering rates of nitrogen fixation. But one day we might hope this would be a wheat plant or a maize plant where it would have nodules on its roots, at least for some applications um, where we could increase the amount of nitrogen directly available to the plant without having to add industrial nitrogen. That's where I'm going to stop. Um, I'm just going to show a picture of my group who, who in the last couple of slides contributed and did all that work. And I think it's really appropriate because, of course, this is a picture of us going um, to the Botanic Garden uh, for a lab meeting uh, on one of the wonderful sunny days we had this summer. And at that point, I'll stop and say thank you very much for listening. Wow, thanks ever so much, Phil. That was that was a fascinating um, talk, as just as we as we knew it would be. Really, really thought provoking, um, and and so relevant to us all as as well. And I can see just how much um, our audience um, enjoyed it because we do have lots of questions, um, more actually than than I, I'm afraid we're going to be able to ask. So uh, apologies if you've asked a question and I and I don't ask it. Um, but we have a, a diversity. Um, so, for example, uh, we have a, a question from Helena who says, as a, a garden or garden designer, um, she's curious to know, apart from trees and legumes, uh, what kind of plants should we be planting to fix the most nitrogen and carbon in the soil? Is there a, um, oh, and is there a nitrogen or carbon fixing calculator for, di for different plants? Oh, that's a really, yeah. yeah. Um, that's a very interesting question. Um, I guess um, in, in, the, in the sort of British context, uh, there would be a lot of things like vetches, for example. Vetches and clovers are all very, very good nitrogen fixers. Um, and actually, I have a sort of uh, botanist colleagues who could probably answer this question better than me, um, who will be able to tell you a whole range of different native legumes, um, which are very good things to um so, of course, for example, um, in the wild, gorse is a, is a legume as well, and that's fixing nitrogen. I'm, I'm not imagining in your garden necessarily going to... But cytisis, a broom, yeah. there are lots of cytisis precocks. Broom, yeah, absolutely. It's is a really nice, creamy-coloured, scented broom <laughs> that you could consider. So, so I think Chris should come up with a calculator for the, the best <laughs> legumes to... to uh, I'll take that as an action. There are a lot, of, there are a lot okay. of them out there and really, really, you know, fantastic and such beautiful flowers as well. That's great. Thanks, Phil. And a, a very different question. Um, um, Emma asks that given the, the majority of, of greenhouse gas emissions come from the oil and gas industry, are changes in diet enough to significantly, significantly impact climate change? And, and I, she may have asked this um, mm -hmm. question before mm -hmm. you, you shared some of your later slides, which showed what a difference um, yes, it, it can yes, make. Yes. So, so the answer is, yes, it can make a huge impact. But it's it's absolutely true unless we stop burning fossil fuels we are cooked there's there's no two ways about it i mean because that can that that produces so much co2 which stays in the atmosphere for thousands of years mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it's not coming down because the cycling of carbon it, it, it doesn't remove it fast enough um, so you need to do both the point i was making was you do need to stop we stop need to stop burning fossil fuels and we need to change agricultural practices and diets all, yeah. all together. Yeah, so certainly for me, it was an eye opener um, seeing your chart where you, you showed the differences between um, dairy and, and and the choices we we can all make. Because I was vaguely aware that well, I, obviously I knew eating beef is bad and that eating chicken is better, but but I hadn't necessarily considered some of the things that that, that the science that you presented showed us. So I thought that was 
that was really useful. Um, this is a question which um, I think it, it's it's broadly contextualized around evolution, I guess, of, of nitrogen mm -hmm. fixation. And but the question is that if plants if other if plants other than legumes do not fix nitrogen, um, do, might they benefit from other legumes around? I'm paraphrasing here that do it for them. And if humans then come along and I, I guess reduce diversity, um, especially crop plants, um, does this leave other, especially crop plants, unviable unless they are artificially fertilized? So I think, sorry, I've, I've cut that down to make sure to be get the gist of it. There's, there's a very, it sounds, I, I, I may not answer the question exactly as, as, as the person asked it, but it's a really important point. And, and I think this is part of the, part of the problem. It's that, yes, diversity is absolutely crucial. And I think there is a danger. I don't think there's any question. There's always a danger if you have genetically modified crops. One of the problem is that you can decrease diversity because it gets dominated by the by the agrochemical industry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, this is why I, I sort of open these up as, as serious questions. I think it can be, and maybe maybe one of the only ways we can get the yields we need without destroying the environment um, is to use some of these genetically modified crops, but but not in a way in which we do not consider diversity really important. So we've got to be planting, we've got to be setting, one of the ideas of course is that you use very high productive land for these sorts of crops. Yeah. And what we should be doing is quite large percentages of our agricultural land should be converted back to prairies, forests, yeah. and so forth, with huge genetic diversity, but recognising that in the very high productive areas where they're very robust as well, the soils are very robust, yeah. we could be using more limited genetic diversity because at the moment we have very, very little genetic diversity anyway in the crops that we actually plant. Um, so we would substitute that limited genetic diversity, possibly with higher yield, these higher yielding genetically modified crops, but where we would then restrict the amount of land we're using, much higher yields. Yeah. But of course, these are very, very controversial, difficult things. They and are. There's no, there's no silver there bullet. Is no, is there it? is no <laughs> right answer to this. There's no easy no. answer. No, 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 no exactly. Think about it. Yeah. And it's yeah. not, it's not me coming and saying, we have to do this. Yeah. It, it's all these things so because we could do an awful lot you can do an awful lot by 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 rotating crops that's the traditional thing to do rotating a cereal with a legume you can improve mm. nitrogen um, input into into farmlands and reduce the amount of nitrogen lost if you do it properly um, yeah nitrogen this, is, this is potentially a short one as we're talking about agriculture um what do you think of the regenerative agriculture movement which i understand very little of but i understand it's relating to, to topsoil and, and and keeping cycles um healthy um yeah, but yeah. i i'm not an expert in regenerative agriculture um because it, i think it means different things to different people but the principle i always say it comes back to those nutrient type cycles that i was i was showing um the principle of course is to preserve carbon in soils um, and and to be able to ensure that the cycling is doing the most good that you can in an agricultural setting. Um, all agriculture is probably in some ways going to reduce the amount of carbon in soil, but the, 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 uh, my understanding of the sort of regenerative agriculture is to do the least damage, to get as much carbon back in the soil as possible. Um, and, and, and so I think in principle, um, it's a good thing, but of course, the devil can be in the detail and, and you have to look at what I always say is you need to look at the, the nutrient cycles for nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon, and what are the balances. And, and actually in, in answering that question, you've answered several of, of the others and I'm afraid I couldn't ask them all because there are too many, but you have um, addressed several of the others are, are, um, and particularly around this multi-pronged approach as well, that there isn't just one silver bullet as, as, as we've mm. seen mm. Um, very, very clearly in in your talk, um, Phil, which was which was truly informative. Um, I can see just how much um, engagement we've had from the audience, how much everyone has enjoyed and um, and and found this 
um, a really inspiring talk. So, so thank you ever so much, um, Phil, on, on behalf of us all. We, we really do appreciate it. And to our audience, thank you for joining us. And, and please join us again in two weeks time on Thursday the 3rd for Professor Katie Field's talk, More Than a Mushroom, How Fungi Shaped Our Planet. So thanks once again, um, sincerely to our, our speaker, Phil, and thank you all for joining. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thanks, Chris.